Hansen, from the middle of nowhere to the top of the charts. One of the few accurate ways of describing it is phenomenal. In just a few years, a trio of brothers from America's heartland went from playing local music festivals to regularly playing in front of 20,000 screaming fans. My name is Jim Smith, and throughout this audio documentary, we shall attempt to discover, through the thoughts of the band and some of their fans, just what makes this incredible trio so popular. From home-produced tapes and self-financed albums, they earned a record deal and produced a debut single that went to number one everywhere from Ireland to Australia. They took their love of music and a natural talent and have filled a niche that most record companies have forgotten existed. They have released a multi-platinum selling home video and managed to sell literally millions of albums. They have travelled the world and appeared on countless TV shows and magazine covers. They have infected global consciousness with their own brand of bright, crafted pop rock. In just a few short years, this sibling trio have focused their talent and determination into becoming a worldwide phenomenon. Their name is Hanson. Clothes. We pack clothes. We pack clothes. Oh, we, we actually just got motorcycles and we take them with us too. No. <laughs> in our bag. Yeah. And we actually did think about taking those with us on tour, you know, sticking them in a semi or something. Um, what she brought up earlier, though, we do take, you know, journals so we can, you know, remind ourselves what happened, you know, in the past when you look back at it. But um, really, you know, you just take what, whatever you need, toothbrushes and, you know, whatever you're going to wear the next day. Nothing, like souvenirs, you mean? nothing necessarily to remind you of home, just things from home. Exactly. And souvenirs, you know, you collect a certain amount of souvenirs as, as things, as time goes on, you know. I mean, it's it's good to have little little trinkets and well, whatnot. Well, you also, and I guess you kind of are tourists as you go to different places, you kind of see different things like yesterday we went to go see Stonehenge which we hadn't seen which is very cool um, and so it was just you know you see the side to be a tourist but not necessarily the musical ability was probably a gift from their parents Walker and Diana Hansen were always musical in high school and college for a while they even spent time travelling with a gospel group they always loved music but never really gave any credence to the idea of attempting to make a career out of it one reason was Walker's work he had a high level job in the oil industry Another reason was that they wanted to start a family. The first baby boy was born on the 17th of November, 1980. They named him Clark Isaac Hansen. A few years later, he was joined by Jordan Taylor Hansen, born 14th of March, 1983. October the 22nd, 1985 was when Zachary Walker Hansen came into the world. The three brothers all quickly discovered an interest in music, forever singing around the house. On Wednesday nights, their parents would go out, leaving instructions that the brothers perform chores, wash dishes and attend to the homework. When they returned, they often found that the sons had written a song instead. There was always singing in the home. Dinah Hansen taught them to sing Amen in harmony for the dinner table. And they taught themselves to sing versions of some of their favourites, like Rockin' Robin and Splish Splash, I Was Taking a Bath. Singing oldies from their father's record collection also helped fuel their initial interest in music and helped hone their gift for crafting melody that would become their signature flair for harmony. The family were, and are, a close unit. Because of the nature of Walker's work, they were likely to have to spend long periods of time travelling. And because of this, Diana decided that it would be more practical to school her boys herself at home. We've always homeschooled, but we've actually also, we have attended private and, and public schools at different points in time. But. Uh, we did. Ha we do have to do school. Unfortunately, it doesn't mean. Yeah, it doesn't mean that we don't have. It just means that we don't have um, bullies beating up on us or whatever. Um, except for him, he just doesn't. It have. just means we get to beat up on each other. There, there are uh, tests that you can take. Just it's, uh, it's called standardized tests. That just to you know, tell you kind of how how well you're doing in subjects about approximately what grade level and all that kind of things. Yeah, our parents basically, you know, you travel around and our parents have always been our teachers. And each different place, like we were just in Mexico and we studied about the Mexican Revolution and we were in France and we were studying about French revolutions, lots of revolutions. But um, <laughs> we were just, each different place you can kind of learn about and then go to visit different sites and really get an idea of what you're, what you're reading about. And so really it's kind, kind of an, an interactive, interactive education, education, definitely. Yeah. Um, honestly, uh, I think because we've spent a lot of time together, uh, as far as uh, kind of works we've, the we've, other homes way around. we've homeschooled all of our lives, basically, and uh, so therefore we spent a lot more time around each other, less age separation and things like that. So I think I think we really uh, get along very, very well. We we don't argue hardly at all, and, and uh, the working relationship goes is it, really good. I mean, of course. 
you know, nobody's angels. We we fight on occasion, but that's I think life. on some ways it kind of helps to be brothers because you know, on the one hand you'd think we fight more. I think we sort of fight less because we know each other so well. It's like you know you get along, but um, I think we and that, also if that, you're gonna fight, you know their next move. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Next yeah. And, we'll and pranks are not hard because they're abroad around South America, the Caribbean, and other parts of the world. One thing they always took with them was music. Growing up, they didn't listen to top 40 radio or modern music at all. Radio and television was always in a different language for them. But they did have their father's tape collection. Part of that collection was a tape simply entitled 1958, part of a year-by-year -year history of rock and roll. And it soon became one of the brothers' favourites. Sometimes they listened to it constantly. While their contemporaries back in the US were listening to MC Hammer and Vanilla Ice, among others, they were getting into Bill Haley and Carl Perkins. They developed a deeper sense of musical history, a wider and more depthful range of influences. Rather than only hearing whatever that week's chart favourite happened to be, they were delving into classic artists of past decades, from Chuck Berry to Little Richard, to Elvis, from Otis Redding to Aretha Franklin to The Supremes. It was a tradition that was eventually to absorb into their own music, a music that was original, but had an awareness of the greater exponents of rock and roll, soul and R&B. Back in the US, at a Christmas party held by Walker's Oil Company, the brothers just up and decided that it might be fun to sing in front of the guests. When Diana saw how much her son seemed to love performing, and heard how the other guests had remarked on their natural gifts, she decided to help start looking for other places where the boys could play. Schools, restaurants, fairs, anywhere where the trio could finger snap and harmonize. By the time the family settled in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the threesome began gathering in the living room to jam in a more organized fashion. The brothers began teaching themselves some real musical instruments. They had all had early piano lessons, and Isaac had been given a small classical guitar at Christmas some years before. In time, Isaac moved up to a Gibson Les Paul lookalike that he secured from a local pawn shop. Zach persuaded a friend to let him borrow a 1960s Ludwig drum kit that had been gathering dust in an attic, and Taylor found a keyboard. Before long, they were starting to work together on original material. I would be surprised if our younger siblings uh, joined the band. I think if they, uh, if they were going to be mm, doing musicians. music, doing music, yeah, being musicians, I think they would probably uh, do it on their own. I would be surprised if they wanted to join the band. And as far as people, as far as our family being involved, I mean, if you're in the middle, if you're in the middle of the living room and you're playing music and you're cranking up this amp, it's kind of hard for them not to be involved. It's like. God, you know. Yeah, they're involved in the in, in the secondary listening way, you know, like ah. Oh. It's kind of like secondary. You know, you smoke. can you can uh, yeah you can listen to the uh, amp and it's playing. Well, it's not exactly like that, but they definitely they enjoy it. I mean, they w if we come up with a new song, it's like oh you know can we hear it or whatever because they're you know they travel with us and they are totally into it and involved in you know what we do. But as far as the music and writing songs and. Recording. Also I mean, that's a arts that. festival so called Mayfest, and at Mayfest '92, the Hansons made their official debut with a 35-minute a cappella set. Diana and Walker Hanson were increasingly impressed and always supportive. In fact, Diana began sending out letters to the growing number of people who were turning out to see them perform, telling them when the group would be playing next, and even selling T-shirts and lemonade at gigs. As the brothers continued to develop their style, the next obvious step was recording. They produced their first album, an indie CD release they called Boomerang. It contained the first song that the brothers had written together on Taylor's cheap little keyboard, Rain, and the whole album was evidence of their emerging talent. Although it was home produced, the songs boasted a slick pop sound that was well beyond their years. They obviously had ability, they had enthusiasm, and they were rapidly becoming polished enough to convince their parents that they might even stand a serious chance of making a professional career out of what they loved doing best. Web author and self-confessed Hansonite Ashley Rayleigh gives her thoughts about the album. On Boomerang, I think it really shows how strong their voices were before the instruments and editing came in. And they were only about 10, 12, and 15 when they did this and recorded this. And if nothing else, I really think it proved their love for music and their love for the oldies rock and roll. Um, you can tell especially because of their Jackson 1994, the family headed down to Austin, did. Texas, where the annual South by Southwest Music Industry Convention was taking place. The boys managed to persuade an entertainment lawyer named Christopher Sebeck to listen to them perform a cappella. 
Sepek was absolutely stunned by what he heard. Zach was only eight at the time, but the brothers had an innate sense of harmony and melody that belied their obvious youth. Sebek clearly recognised a good thing when he heard it, and realising their talent well beyond their years, he immediately asked to be introduced to their parents and quickly offered to become the band's manager. Success was still some time off, however. At the time, the grunge scene was reigning supreme, and record companies seemed to have forgotten that there still might be a market for music with a sense of fun and classic pop sensibilities. They were turned down initially by a host of labels, including their eventual home, Mercury Records. However, they used this time to become even more confident on their chosen instruments, to work harder on their songwriting strengths, and they released a second indie album with the title Mbop. While Boomerang had been filled with a boys to men meets an act of bass style pop, Mbop moved away from R&B and blue eyed soul and back towards rock and roll. This was the more confident example of the band's developing style, a better indication of what Hanson were capable of. The title track was destined to become the band's first classic hit, and the album also included early versions of Thinking of You and With You in Your Dreams, tracks they would develop and re-record for inclusion on their major label debut album, Middle of Nowhere. Another important aspect was that this time the tracks were self-produced, original Hanson compositions, and their pure quality shone through. Chris Sebeck held on to his faith in the band, and several of the record people he had approached could see no further than their youthful appearance. Without bothering to listen properly, they dismissed Hanson offhand as a mere novelty. He was even told to distance himself and drop the act before he was humiliated. He knew differently, though, and armed with a copy of the Umbop CD, he approached Mercury Records and asked them to listen and think again. On the strength of the CD, Mercury decided to send a representative, Steve Greenberg, to catch Hanson live at the 1996 Kansas State Fair. Seeing was believing, Greenberg saw enough and was immediately impressed enough to sign the band to a six-album deal. By this time, Hanson had an incredible 200 songs to choose from. They moved to Los Angeles to spend the rest of the year working on their major label debut. To create Middle of Nowhere, they began working with famous producers such as Steve Laroni and the Dust Brothers. Laroni had produced Black Grape's debut album and the Dust Brothers had just scored a major critical and commercial success with the Beck album, Eau Delay. The band had put into contact with co-writers like Barry Mann, Cynthia Whale, Desmond Child and Mark Hudson. It was a meshing of hip recording and a timeless pop craft. The Hanson brothers shared writing credits for all the songs on the album, and solo credits for what were eventually to be their greatest hits, Umbop and Thinking of You. Mercury were impressed enough by the band's efforts to hire video director Tamara Davis, and set their press and publicity machinery into work prior to the spring of 1997 in order to release their first single. Umbop was eventually released that April, and debuted at number 13 in the US charts. The combination of infectious, good-time pop, crafted melodies and a photogenic good look created an avalanche of interest. The video was immediately added to MTV's playlist and the song went on to be number one all over the globe. When the album was released to a host of positive reviews, Handsome Mania was officially born. But now let's hear what the fans really feel about Middle of Nowhere. Firstly, we'll hear from Erin Daly, followed once again by Ashley Rayleigh. Middle of Nowhere was the first CD I got of Hanson's. I love every single song on it, but I think one of my favorites is With You and Your Dreams because they wrote it in memory of their grandma. I also like Man from Milwaukee a lot because I live near Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and it's pretty cool that the song is about a man from Milwaukee. On Middle of Nowhere, it sounds a lot different than the other two. It sounds a lot more professional, obviously, with the work of all the great producers they worked with and I think their writing skills were really improved. I'm sure they learned a lot from Middle of Nowhere. It sounds really professional and good. I just love that album because it was just, I don't know, so wonderful and they practiced all the time and I'm sure, you know, they were really nervous going in there to work with all these people as, you know, their first national recording and everything, but I think it was amazingly well done. There's no secret. We just, I mean, the fans are not out to hurt you or kill you or whatever. They're just excited, so. You know, we're just excited to see them. Well, we, we enjoy, you know, getting to uh, getting to talk to them, and a lot of oftentimes, you know, you get to talk to them outside the hotel or whatnot, and and it's and it's good to it's good to you know say hello to them and and you know get to sign stuff for them and all that kind of stuff. So it's it's cool. We enjoy meeting them. Um, we, you definitely recognize uh, certain fans, certain people that show up at a lot of different places. You, you, there's the New York fan club and the London fan club, and you can and you know their faces, and it's quite interesting actually. But um, no, no stalkers per se. 
Would you like a silver? Uh, probably not. Not particularly, no. <laughs> I, I, if if you're offering... No thanks. <laughs> I don't so like older women. self-confessed <laughs> handsome nuts, Hannah Williams. Middle of Nowhere has just about everything on it. There's rock songs like Look At You and Speechless, pure pop songs such as Mbop, and more mellow ones like With You In Your Dreams and I Will Come To You. Hanson's sunny pop message was a world away from the gloom-ridden self-loathing that seemed to fuel grunge. The dark attitude that seemed to dominate 90s alternative music was almost the norm. Hanson provided an intriguing real alternative to the supposed alternative scene. The huge reaction from the fans seemed to harken back to the glory days of young bands, from a generation ago to the 1970s, where youthful groups like the Jackson Five, the Osmonds, and even the mythical Partridge family used to rule the charts. Hanson's early influences were probably similar to the music that influenced the Jacksons, and their early live sets had contained a version of the Jackson Five's Love You Save. Yet there was also a classically timeless quality to the music that Hanson were making that gave them an appeal far beyond just the hordes of screaming girls. Their songs had won them fans from all age groups. They reached number one in the prodigious Village Voice poll, earned rave reviews in everything from Spin to Rolling Stone to the New York Times, and received recognition from the industry and their peers with three Grammy nominations. Let's hear again from Hannah Williams and Ashley Rayleigh. I think Hanson's popular appeal is attributed to their upbeat songs, great personalities, and the fact that they write their own songs and play instruments, unlike many bands such as the Backstreet Boys. Hanson's main appeal to me is their music. It always lifts my spirits and I enjoy watching them on television appearances and seeing them do what they love most, making and performing music. Hanson is in the music business for the right reasons. Plus, you can't deny, it. they are so cute. I think what really appeals to a lot of people about Hanson is how young they really are. And it especially appeals to young people like me because it's fun to see people out there doing what they love to do at such a young age and going for their goals and being successful at what they love to do. I think that's really special to us because it shows that if you really set your mind up to something, you can do whatever you want to do by, you know, working hard for it. I think Hansel, Hansen is just great role models. I think we should have more people out there that are talented and being successful and doing what they love to do all at the same time and getting respect from it because so many people really love what they're doing. Not just young people like me, but critics as well. While their fame really and popularity was becoming a juggernaut, really cool. they somehow found time to record and release a Christmas album, Snowed In. Combined sales of Middle of Nowhere and Snowed In reached in excess of 12 million copies, an outstanding achievement for any band's first full year. The ever-expanding audience, however, was hungry for far more, and in 1998 they tried to satisfy some of that demand by issuing Three Car Garage, the independent recordings from 95 to 1996. The album culled material from their original Umbop album, which had long since gone out of print, and became a much sought-after collector's item. Um, well, we really didn't think of it as, as looking back, really. The reason that we released it was because we got, again, a lot of letters, a lot of requests from people. When are we going to hear that music? We want to hear that music. We got so many requests that we decided... It's really for the same reason that we decided to tour, just because the fans, you know, the fan power is really incredible. And they, you know, calling saying, please, please, please. And that's really the reason. We haven't, we are on tour right now and there's not a new album out and they're going, you know, there's some new music. So really, it's because the fans have requested something else to hear because we talked about it and we talked about other music that we recorded earlier. And really, really this is kind of like, it's kind of like for the diehard fans that really, really want to hear this. And that's, you know, that's what it's about. And also, you know, we are going to be playing a lot of those songs in the show too, so therefore, you know, people that have that, that record can Kind of be those familiar songs. with those songs, yeah. yeah. You know, it is what it is. We spent about four hours a song, you know, it was just, it's like one, two, three, go. You yeah, know, exactly. it's not like a real studio album, it's... Well, it was demos. I mean, we spent four hours a song in a small garage, eight-track recorder. I mean, it, it was very much independent, very raw, and, and, you know, we just, we still, you know, very much enjoy listening to the, to the music and thought that our fans would probably like that also, and so... And, yeah. Well, because they were asking for it, we decided to release it. They're going to be remixes. 
Uh, no remixes, no. no. Exactly it's, really kind of, it it's really kind of funny because it's a new album, and you know, you go out there and promote and you say, we have this new album, Three Car Garage. But on the other hand, it's not. So we know you won't be listening to the radio and say, oh, that's, you know, their new album. Because it's, you know, it's, we really, in a way, we've tried not to promote it. Because it is, you know, it is an old record. And it is, you know, it's not the newest thing. And actually, really, those, those songs are not actually going to be played on the radio, actually. They're just... They're just for, again, the diehard fans that really want to buy the record and hear the old stuff. I think it was a really great idea for Hanson to make Three Car Garage because I know all their fans were dying to hear what they sounded like when they were younger. And the only other way to hear them when they were beginning was if you had the rare Mbop or Boomerang CDs, which aren't being made or sold anymore. Three Car Garage is made up of songs that were demos for record companies. This CD lets you hear what Hanson sounded like in 1995. Earlier versions of Thinking of You, River, Mbop, and With You in Your Dreams are all on Three Car Garage. This CD proves just how talented Hanson was even at a younger age. On Three Car Garage, I think a lot of it is the same as Boomerang hearing what they did when they were younger, except you can really see when they became involved in the music. They wrote all the songs and played the instruments, and they even produced this one, so that was neat. Um, and I really think it's amazing that they could produce something like that. I'm 15 now, and I wouldn't even know where to begin on something like that. So the fact that they did that when they were younger than me is just amazing to me. I can't even imagine. Um, I think they really must have been dedicated beyond belief to the music when they were in a studio recording an album. While most kids their age are out running around playing baseball with their friends and stuff like that, so I know I wasn't that dedicated in my age. Nineteen ninety-eight also probably saw the now, band complete so a hugely song. successful first nationwide tour. Something the brothers enjoyed so much that they decided to commit it to record for prosperity. Hansen, live from Albertine, is a concert album recorded at the Key Arena in Seattle on July the twenty-first, nineteen ninety-eight. Produced by Hansen and Elliot Shiner. The band were also attempting to capture their live experience, performing storming renditions of the hits Umbop, Where's the Love, and I Will Come to You. New material like Ever Lonely, and in a nod towards some of their early influences, versions of some of the classic rock songs that provided them with initial inspiration. Songs like Gimme Some Lovin' and Money That's All That I Want. The band also had a hand in producing an accompanying video, a visual diary of life on the road, the road to Albertaine. Albertaine itself is the imaginary home planet of a fictitious alien mentioned in the lyrics to one of Hanson's own songs, Man from Milwaukee. The tongue-in-cheek titles of the album and the video are typical of Hanson humour. The video manages to catch examples of that humour with snatches of behind-the-scenes antics. Almost a home movie, in fact, but one that shows how much work is involved during a hectic touring schedule, and one that has the benefit of stunning live concert footage. But what do the fans think of their live performances? Live from Albertina is a really good CD too. Even though there are only a few new songs, I highly recommend it because they sound so much different. Most of the songs are from Middle of Nowhere or Three Car Garage, but their voices get so much deeper and it's more fun to listen to because it's recorded live from their concert in Seattle, Washington. I went to the Hanson concert in Milwaukee, Wisconsin when they were on their Albertine tour. And I really had a great time, even though my seats were really bad. But they sounded really good, and they did a really good jo job getting the crowd into it. Everyone was either singing along or screaming. It was really fun, but next time I hope I can get better seats. Uh, I don't think I necessarily miss anything. I, I think we're, we're doing just something that we're doing what we've always wanted to do. I, I don't ever have any regrets of, you know, Oh yeah, I, I missed out on something like that. There's nothing that I that I really miss or anything like that. I guess you could miss the occasional thing like uh, you can't always go and do stuff because you like might... the mall or something like that. Yeah, because the you mall. Have to, you know, walk around the corner, put a little hat on or something like that. But um, I know I think we've I think we've gotten to do a lot of cool things, and we're still just three normal guys. You know, we don't have any antlers going out of our heads or something like that. So we, at least I don't think we do. So we're you know. We're just kind of doing our thing. Live from Albertine is a great CD. For the ones who didn't get to see Hanson on the Albertine tour, this CD gives them a little taste of what it was like. For me and others that did attend the tour, it recaptures the magic of just being there. On Live from Albertine, you get to hear them sing most of the songs from the CD, Middle of Nowhere, 
Isaac singing a beautiful love ballad called More Than Anything, and some covers such as Give Me Some Lovin', Shake a Tail Feather by the Spencer Davis Group. This is a definite must-have for all Hanson fans and is my favorite. I've seen Hanson live twice, once in Atlanta and once in Nashville. There is no way to describe what it was like to be a part of the crowd on the Albertain tour. It was great to get to be around thousands of other Hanson fans, and seeing these three guys live lets you experience Hanson at their best. It was wild. Hanson had the crowd pumped the whole time, and even my parents were getting into it. One minute you're jumping and clapping and screaming, the next just swaying back and forth to slower a cappella songs. The unplugged part of Hanson's set allowed you to hear their harmonic voices loud and clear. In Nashville, I had the opportunity of going backstage to the official fan club Mo, which means middle of everywhere. Isaac, Taylor, and Zach are down to earth guys who really appreciate all the people who helped them get to where they are today. And I look forward to seeing Hanson in concert again sometime, and hopefully I will have the chance to meet them again too. Um, well, first of all, we have totally nothing against Bewitched. Go Bewitched, because they're doing really well. <laughs> and um, uh, we had, what happened was they were booked without our knowledge. The promoter booked them, and we had said to the promoter, you know, with the front band that's going to be in front of us, would they be a live band? So a that's local live band. A local live band, and that's just that was just a. This happened when we found out that Bewitched had been booked, it was just one of those things. So we totally have nothing against them. And um, go Sorry, it happened, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think there's different music for all different people, and, and uh, that, you know, that doesn't necessarily, the fact that they, you know, that someone doesn't necessarily play an instrument doesn't make them any more or less credible, I think. No, uh, it's, just, it's just we think a... Uh, the live band would work better with our show. Just yeah, like, and I think actually you probably you you'll know what we mean when if you come to the show tonight because uh, it's it's very much you know rock and roll and everything like that. And I think I think it's that just, just each act has their own, each their own thing that they do. So I think Dee Witch has that. The reason we're touring now is we wanted to we just wanted to get in place get out and play shows. All year we've been doing you know press and really we haven't been playing as you just said. Um, so really what we're trying to do is at least get out and play a few shows just to be able to play for us just because we have the urge to play shows. And also, like you said, for the fans because we've gotten so many letters and, and people just when we were in London, for instance, people saying, when are you going to come and play? And so we're just doing, it's we're doing a fairly short tour and then we're going to get back in the studio and do the next album. On Life, for Al Life from Albertine. It's another awesome CD and I think it's really cool because you get to hear Hanson doing what they love to do. They're out there playing music and performing in front of crowds and it really captures the feeling of a concert if you weren't lucky enough to go. Um, the sound is so energetic and loud and just fun. I think it's a really great accomplishment because it proves that Hanson does have a lot of talent without all the technical enhancements of a studio and the editing and stuff like that. So I think it's was also an accomplishment for them because of the fact that it shows they weren't afraid to get out there and show everybody how talented they were and what they could do live. I saw them in Denver at Red Rocks and they were so amazing. I was so impressed by what they were like. I mean, it, I expected them to be pretty good and everything, but when I was there it was amazing. It was so much better than I even expected. I never expected them to do that much. The show was a lot longer than I expected and it was so amazing. I mean, they blew me away with how talented they were. Um, the three people I went to the concert with weren't even really Hanson fans at the time. They just kind of went with me because I asked them to. And so they went with me and when they left, they were really impressed too. They said that Hanson was a much better life than they'd ever expected. I mean, I think everybody expected them to be pretty bad, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, I mean, there's no way they can sound as good as they do on their CD or whatever, but they were so amazing live, and they just had this like, spark. <laughs> they just caught your eye. They were really great. I don't know how to describe it. They were wonderful. What's the weirdest thing about being in the UK? The weirdest thing? Um, the people. They're so weird. <laughs> 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 um, no, we actually, we actually really enjoy being in the UK. The UK is, has, been very, has been very supportive of the band and everything, and we actually really enjoy here. Uh, London is a great is a great city and we've many things to do. So yeah, um, yeah, nothing against nothing against the UK. It's great to be here. 
How important is it to you how well your record's doing? Um, I think it's important in the sense that if your record is doing well, it therefore means that you can continue to do music. You Sorry. can continue to tour and and, and uh, people can will continue to enjoy them. I think we've had a I think we've had a great go, so we're we're very psyched about what's to come. Things come and go and and honestly, you know, you, you can't predict the future. We're just gonna continue to do what we do as best as we can and uh, hopefully people will be receptive and enjoy the music as time goes on. Yeah, I think really what you hope is that be able to grow with you, you know, you come up with some new idea and then the fans go, huh, you know. But we'll just, as you said, you know, we'll just keep doing the same thing we've always done. I think being brothers is going to help you be around, got to help us uh, for as long as the Bee Gees. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, um, the Bee Gees, I think the, reason, I think the reason they stayed around so long is because they wear such tight pants. Um, and it, I don't know, it like lengthens your lifespan or something, it's like, never mind. No. Um, I don't think that has anything to do with staying around, I think maybe it helps the reason that we work so well together may be because we're brothers, but, I mean, look at the Beatles. That's, I mean, they weren't brothers. But, so, I mean, I don't think that, I mean, as there's been so many groups that weren't brothers or whatever. That I, it, it, all brothers. Has, it all has to do with, with, your, with your relationship with each other and, and why you're doing it, I think. You know, and if really, you're all in it for the same reason, if, you're all, if you've all got the same kind of goals and and things like that, then I think you'll, then I think you probably have a pretty sounds. good chance of Multi-platinum selling around. home video, screaming fans all around the world and a whole host of merchandising. Breathtaking success achieved at a breakneck speed. From teenagers to baby boomers, rock fans and pop fans, people of all ages and from all walks of life have recognised their talent. Hans and the band have also managed to convince large parts of a notoriously cynical industry that there is a market for music that promotes positivity and brightness, even a sense of fun. Their youth could so easily have worked against them. They might have only had a limited success as a novelty, but Hansen are not really a young band. They are just a band that happens to be young. It's the music that matters, regardless of age, and their songwriting is steeped in tradition, talent and an awareness of what came before, and also has a compelling sense of craft. The governor of Oklahoma recently proclaimed that May the 6th, from now on, will officially be Hanson Day, and it is rumoured that their story is about to be made into a film. Hanson will be around for a good time yet, doing what they love and doing what they do best. Definitely written songs for that album already. In fact, uh, we have quite a few at this point that we feel will probably be on the next record. Um, I think well, there's kind of music. Run. There is yeah, music. There's music. There's music, and we'll, we will songs. be playing. We'll be playing. Um, there will be some instruments in this album. Uh, what else about it? And vocals. There'll be a cover for the album too. Yeah. Um, you know, we we actually really don't. Uh, I guess you could say we don't really have any plans at this point for that album you just, know, we just don't, song ideas really yeah just songs and, and things like that you know you're just in the process of it all coming together so we're we're really concentrated on the tour right now the tour is what we're focused on and just getting out and playing for people and that's really very much something that we wanted to do for a long time and so we're happy to be here and, and playing the show tonight and it's going to be a lot of fun you know I think we're just going to do the music we're just going to do it and if it changes direction so it stays the same no that's up to the music well really uh, we don't really think about like i mean what direction was the first record i don't know you know it was just really what are. it was just who we were at that point in time and you know certain things change as time goes on but it's always going to be handsome and i think you'll always be able to recognize that um you know but it I think no. it also, I mean, it just depends on like the environment that each song has been written in. Because a lot of times, you know, over the past year, we've been on the road a lot. So maybe, so, you know, we always take an acoustic guitar, or I don't take an acoustic guitar, he does. But, um, you know, maybe some, some songs are more acoustic based or, you know, things like that. But as far as the production of the songs and how it's going to really turn out, that's just going to happen on the fly, as, you know, as it always does. You get, we've been we've got a lot of songs. songs at this point that we've written that, you know, very are, about we're very excited about it.